if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. We have finished. We have done well. I was kind of disappointed there was no confetti last week, but uh, we have finished the gospel project, gone all the way through Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. We're glad you're with us in the start of a new series called Win the Day. Now, I've already noticed it's been a busy, hectic morning, and I noticed that on my printer at home is the copy with all of my scripture verses. So I'm going to have to read it out of the Bible in small print today. So I've got my spectacles. We'll be okay, but it's going to be a little rough going. Uh, but we're glad that you're here for this uh, special occasion, Win the Day. There is a book called Win the Day by Mark Batterson. Uh, it's, it's called Win the Day, and it simply uh, talks about how to win the day, each day. And I want to make sure you understand as we get into this, it's going to be based on what we learn in Scripture. Some of you are going to hear this. Uh, I read Mark's book and, and thought it was great, but at times I thought, boy, it's like, this sounds like pop psychology, and, and I don't want that to be the case. I, I hope nobody would dare, after five years of going from Genesis to Revelation, all Scripture accuse us of being a pop culture type of a church. We base everything we do on Scripture, and I hope you'll see that the messages are based on God's Word. But you know, God is the creator of our minds and our psychology, and I think he has a lot to say about how we mentally go through our lives and how we live each day. And so hopefully you find it extremely practical and helpful. Let's pray before we jump into our, our thoughts this morning. Would you pray with me? You don't have to say this out loud, but if you just say, God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. God, since there's something you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. And God, we do pray that you'd be glorified. Everyone hearing this message today would be uh, edified, and we pray that Satan would be horrified. We pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. We will end today with communion. Hopefully you have the elements. If you haven't picked up your uh, packet, these are on the back table there, so make sure you get those before we're done with the message this morning. Win the day. Yale University, April 20th, 1913. Sir William. I should just wear these. Sir William Osler got up to give the commencement address, and he really said five words. Four, if you believe a hyphen is one word. He said, Live in daytight compartments. That's the whole thought of his commitment speech in 1913. Live in daytight compartments. What does he mean by that? Well, 49.6% of the time, our thinking is outside of the current moment. We're depressed about the past. We're worried about the future. And that's where we're living. Many of you today, as you come in, you're living in the past, depressed about what's happened, and you're discouraged, and then most of us are also worried about what's coming, and we live in anxiety. We're either living in a depression about what happened or anxiety about what's to come, and we don't live in the day. And if we would just learn that God provided for us in his scripture a plan that we should live each day and win each day, we're living in the wrong time zone. This morning as you leave and you're in your cars on your way home, I want you to think that about that. Am I living in the wrong time zone? And don't just cross over into Illinois. I'm, I'm saying, are you living in today? Are you living in the past or living in the future and you're not living in the moment? We are distracted, frustrated, half present, half the time, which means we're half alive. And I want you to know that God wants you to be fully present and fully alive. And this isn't just a good idea, it's a God idea. It's a God idea. Let's go to Scripture and hear what he has to say. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Take up your cross daily. Take this day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. His mercies are new every morning. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. 
Do you see how in Scripture God constantly reminds us, live in the day. Stop living in your past. Start, stop living in your future. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about my PowerPoint because this doesn't seem to be the one that I, I needed you to open from the to shared drive that I put on this morning. This should be, there should be yellow words on the screen. It's okay. I'm going to keep moving on, uh, but we'll see what happens. This is a God idea. It's a God idea. Yesterday is history. Say it with me. Yesterday is history. we got to flip the script. So tomorrow is a mystery. Say that with me. Tomorrow is a mystery. Win the day. Say it with me. Win the day. The big idea for the message this morning is that if you want to change your life, you have to change your story. But don't walk away saying, I've got to do this. This is what I've got to do. I've got to change this on my own power. No, simply you need to flip the script. And that's the, the title of the message today is flip the script. Next week we're going to eat the frog. Then we're going to learn to wind the clock, fly the clock, cut the rope. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, sermon titles that go with this series. But today you need to learn to flip the script. And by doing so, I'm not telling you to change your story on your own simply change your story from the small story of you to the big story that god has for you flip your script see what god's doing in your life don't keep living in yesterday or waiting for tomorrow and worrying about it but change your story Whatever idea you're going after, whatever problem you're trying to solve, whatever habit you're trying to build or break, it has to happen one day at a time. Win the day, get up, and do it again. Two days in a row, it's called a winning streak. It's also called sanctification. This is a biblical idea, friends. And I really don't want you thinking this is, is, is shallow or pop psychology. I want us as a church to embrace this mentality and start living in the moment, living in each day that God has given us and winning each day. We tend to not be living in the day, so we're losing each day. We're on a losing streak. God wants us to be on a winning streak, and that means that we need to win the day and get up and win the day again tomorrow. I have a lot to say about that today. God is able to do much more than we could ever. It, the Bible says he can do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Think about that. 75% of New Year's resolutions fail in the first month. One-year timelines are overwhelming. How many of you have ever started a New Year's resolution and failed? Amen. The gyms live on that. <laughs> The gyms live for the money in January because they know that they'll get that whole year's worth and then you won't come back, right? Uh, Year-long goals just don't cut it. But let me ask you this. If you got a new habit that you need to start or you got a bad habit that you need to break, now I'm not going to ask you if you can do it for a whole year because each of you would probably think, no, I'll probably fail. But can I ask you an important question this morning? Can you do it for a day? I'm not asking you to get up and read Scripture every day for a year and go through the Bible in one year. I'm not asking you to, but can I ask you a simple question? Can you get up and read God's Word for one day? How many of you think you could do that? I know you can. Of course you can. All of us in here can do it for one day. Then you get up and you do it again, and you got a winning streak and the beginning of sanctification. Win the day. We need to stop thinking about year-long commitments and start thinking about day-tight compartments. There are decades when nothing happens, and there are days when decades happen. Behavioral change is when you do something more or less, but that's external. Conceptual change is something that's internal. It happens in the mind. 80% of our thoughts are negative. Nothing will really change if you just try to change behavior. But if you change the way you think, if you start changing the way your mind concepts the way you want to live, the way God wants you to live, the problem is that 80% of the time we have stinking thinking. And it's our stinking thinking that ruins us. Do you have stinking thinking? How many of you are glass half empty type people? Nobody's going to admit it. Come on, you're in my club. My wife tells me all the time. My wife tells me all the time, your glass is half empty and somebody put a hole in the bottom of it. I just, I, I have stinking thinking and I know I do. But if we will meet with God each day, I've got something to promise you. If we'll meet with God each day and win the day, 
He's going to show up and he's going to show off. Win the day. Win the day. So this morning, I'm going to go through a story in the Old Testament that talks about flipping the script. Somebody who flipped the script. The key verse is Genesis 50 and verse 20. And this key character says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Who knows who this character is that said that? Yes, it's Joseph. We're going to read the story of Joseph today, if pastor can read the small print in the Bible. We're going to read it, and we're going to find together how Joseph took his story, which was a story that could be all about depression and anxiety. It could be all about depression about what happened in the past, anxiety about what the future is going to hold. Instead, he flipped the script. You heard him flip the script right here in this verse, and he decided to win the day. And you and I need to take his example and follow it. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 30. Meet me there in a technology or something that you have with you. If you've got a, the text, there's Bibles in the seats and the baskets in front of you. We're going to go to Matt, or Genesis chapter 37. And I'd like to read this whole chapter. Don't lose me. We're going to walk through the story of Joseph. Genesis 37, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old, how old was he? You're not with me. Joseph being 17 years old, how old was he? Was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. He's a tattletale. How many of you love a younger brother who's a tattletale? Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. We've got, we got bad family dynamics going on. Because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully with him. Welcome to family. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed, uh, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come and bow, to our, bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father Father kept the saying in mind. Friends, if you have a dream that your older brothers and sisters bow down to you, don't tell them. You don't tell them that. It didn't go well for Joseph. He's, he's a, a tattletale. He's, he's kind of a brat. And, and here he's got this dream of his whole family bowing down before him. And he tells them all about it. And of course, he's got the fancy coat. The brothers are jealous. He's loved more than they are. It's not going well in the Jacob household. Let's keep going. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are, you not, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, Here I am. So he said to them, Now go, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, where, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, They have gone away. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. I don't know about you, but Joseph is a dreamer, but he's also kind of lost, isn't he? He's a wandering daydreamer. Can't find the field or his brothers or the sheep. He gets pointed in the right direction in verse 18. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Uh-oh. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. 
Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into the pit here into the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. Praise God for older siblings. Who's an oldest child in the family? Thank you. Oh, it's good to have responsible people here. Amen. Who's the baby of the family? Yeah, daydreaming, wanderers, lost, can't even find the sheep, about ready to get killed. Where's the middle child? You are afraid I was going to leave you out, weren't you? Put your hand down. All right. Verse 23, so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. The Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped it in blood. And and they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It's my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments, put on sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son, mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him to Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So far in this story, you can see where you You can can look look at the past and dwell in the past. There's a lot of things that's happened to Joseph so far. And yeah, he's a dreamer and and a wanderer and a little annoying, but come on. Seriously, they stripped him of his robe and and wanted to kill him. And they sold their own brother as a slave. Joseph's been sold now. The Bible says he gets resold and and he ends up at a high-ranking official in Egypt. Let's go to Genesis 39. Things go from bad to worse. Genesis 39, 1 through 11. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So Joseph left all that he had in charge in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as As she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, to be with her. But one day he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was in the house. She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled, and he got out of the house. Things are going bad to worse. (laughs) 
you got a moment where you see God's blessing on a life even though things hadn't gone the way you would have expected them and you see that God is touching Joseph's life and things are blessed. Everybody say blessed. He's been put in charge. He was sold as a slave, but now he's got position. And his master sees how beneficial he is, and he's well-liked. But then comes the wife. And she comes on to him. He's handsome and young. And I love the verse that said, he left his garment and he ran. Sometimes you just got to get out of Dodge. Can I tell you, if you're flirting with sin and you stick around, you're going to get bit. Sometimes you just need to run. (laughs) I know we don't run from Satan. The only place it's not protected in the armor of God is in the rear end. Now, everything else is well protected. You got to take your stand against the evil one. But when you're in the midst of temptation, get out of Dodge. Get out of Dodge. You know, you heard that saying, I've told the story before about the guy who wanted to get on a diet. And uh, he used to start every day by, by going to the donut shop. That's what his day started with. And he said, if I just wouldn't eat the donuts, I would probably lose weight. So he said, God, I tell you what, tomorrow I need your help. When I go to the donut shop, I just pray that all the parking spaces are filled. And I'll just go right on by. So the next day he goes and gets a donut. He doesn't feel bad about it at all. There was a parking spot open after he drove around the block five times. You see, sometimes we don't run. We run to our temptations. Joseph did the right thing. But even though he did the right thing, you know what happens? Potiphar takes that garment, takes it to her husband and said, that guy tried to rape me. (coughs) Just the opposite of the truth. This, This guy, Joseph has been sold by his brothers into slavery, lied to the dad saying he'd been murdered, and he'd been sold a couple of times. Now he's in this house and the wife comes on to him. He does the noble and right thing. And he ends up getting thrown into jail. This husband who had put his trust in him had his trust broken by a lying wife. Joseph ends up in jail. Let's fast forward. You might know the rest of the story. There's a cupbearer and a baker and all sorts of things happening in prison. The dreamer has more dreams and he, he interprets dreams and, and <coughs> he gets a promise from these, these guys he met in jail that they were going to represent him to the, to the, the Pharaoh and they, he's going to get him out of jail, but they forgot him. They forgot him, left him in there. Two more years he spent in prison. What would you do? What would you do? Would you live to win the day or would you live angry and seething about the past, wanting revenge, worried about your future? What's going to happen to me now? I'm in jail. Nobody remembers. I'm here with no help, anxious about tomorrow. Let's see what Joseph does. Let's skip to Genesis 45, verses 1 through 3. Turn there with me. Genesis 45, 1 through 3. A lot of things have happened. Joseph now, by the way, is 30 years old. How old was he when he got thrown in the pit? Good job. So 17, now he's 30 years old. In that time frame, he spent time in prison. He's been worried, concerned, and anxious. But now... He has come to the place with God's blessing that he is second in command of all Egypt. Wow, that's pretty amazing. You know, it's pretty amazing how God takes brats and turns them into something incredible. As a youth pastor, I loved seeing what God would do with young people. Had a kid drove me nuts. He'd sit behind me on the church bus, right on the bar. There's a metal bar right there. Everybody's supposed to stay behind the bar. The kid sat with his legs around my chair on the bar, talking to me in my ear the whole trip, nonstop. La, 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 la. Junior high kid. God bless junior hires, but oh Lord, God does that mean trick where their voice changes and they did their voice is just loud and it's ah, and it's just like a cat. It's like a cat screeching while scratching a blackboard. And he's, the whole time, he's in my ear. And you think, Lord, is he ever going to turn into anything? Yeah, today he's been a police officer for a long time, well-respected in his community. It's fun to see that. It's fun to see what God does with daydreamers and wanderers and lost souls. God takes him in a hopeless situation, puts him in second in command of all of Egypt. And guess what? 
there's a famine and his brothers are sent to beg for food and his brothers come in and what do they do they bow down in his presence they don't know it's him he's 30 last time they saw him he was 17 he's got a new name now by the way does anybody know for 100 point jeopardy uh does anybody know what joseph's new name is nobody i wrote it down Zephaniah Panea, yeah. Zephaniah Panea. See, when, when the Pharaoh made him second in charge, he gets a new identity and he changes his name from Joseph to Zephaniah Panea. He's got on his new Egyptian ruling clothes and I don't know, he's looking a lot different and a lot better than the last time his brothers saw him as they were stripping him naked, throwing him in a pit. Now they come into the room trying to beg for food, hit the ground bowing to him, and it's Joseph. What would you do? <coughs> would that be your moment to seek revenge? I hate to be picky, but could you turn on the uh, message lights because you got us on worship lights. I can't see the people. I'm real picky about not, y'all are too pretty not to see. There you go. Goodness, good to see you. Oh, man. I tried not to do it. I did. I sat here for the longest time going, Lord, I need lights. Let there be light. And then I figured, I just got to break down and ask. Thank you. What would you do? Would you seek revenge? Chapter 45, Genesis. Then Joseph couldn't control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, so the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brother, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence, and they probably peed their pants. Oh, my goodness. What an epic story in Scripture after all they had done. They thought this was a done story. They lied to their father that he was murdered, and they thought, done, gone, we're finished with Joseph. He's He's nothing but trouble. And then there's this moment where it's just the brothers in the room, and Joseph can't wait. He says to him, I am Joseph. I am your brother. Instead of saying, nana, nana, boo, boo, you just bowed down to me. Remember my dream? Oh, he messes with them. He did, he did some mischief himself, messing with his brothers for a while. But he gets it right in Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but, everybody say but. but. God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Do you see how Joseph wins the day? He flips his script. He doesn't live out of that old story of revenge and his past. He doesn't live out of fear about what's coming in the future and anxiety. He flips the script and he said, what you did was wrong, but God. He flips the script and he starts telling a God story instead of a Joseph story. God intended to save many people through this. I love it. So what do we learn through this? Three things I want to give you today. How can I flip my script and change my story? Number one, I must know my name. Did you see how Joseph said it in Genesis 45, verse 3? He didn't say, I'm Panetha, Panetha, Panera bread. He said, I am Joseph. He said his name. He revealed him who he really was to his brothers. Guys, the first thing you need to do to flip your script and to really change your story is to know who you are. Do you know who you are in Christ? Satan is a stealer. The Bible says he came to steal, kill, and destroy. You think identity theft is a problem with your finances? I'm telling you, spiritually, identity theft is killing us in the church because God's children, are, their identity is being stolen by Satan, being ripped away, and we're living in depression over the past. We're living in anxiety about the future, and none of us are living the story that God has today. If we would just win the day, live in God's story, I am Joseph. So I want you to stand up where you're at. I know it's awkward to just stand right where you are. Go ahead. I'll wait. Stand to your feet. I want us to say what's on the screen today. I'm going to say it first. You repeat after me. I am blessed. I am, blessed. I am, chosen. I am chosen. I am blameless. I am, blameless. I am, adopted. I am adopted. I am redeemed. 
I am sealed. I am stamped. I am loved. You didn't say it good enough. I am loved. I am loved. You can sit down. Do you know who you are? Do you know what your name is? You're redeemed. You're a child of God. That means something significant has happened that we're going to talk about in your story of your life. I must know my name. I must fix my focus. Our problem is by living outside of our time zone, we're focusing on the wrong things. Joseph could have been focused on everything that happened to him. Most of us would have been bent on revenge, or he could have been focused on the future. Instead, Joseph won the day by flipping his script and telling the story of God in his life, what God was doing in his life. We We need need to to fix our focus. Malachi 3, 2 through 3, it says, Who is able to endure? Who is able to stand? He will be like a blazing fire that refines metal, like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. We've got to change our focus. We're so good at stinking thinking. The year 2020 is going to go down in history is awful, isn't it? And, and most of us know this meme. You probably saw it. If there was ever a meme that talked about the year 2020, it's a dumpster fire in the midst of a flood, right? Doesn't that just sum it up? But I'm here to tell you, if we as believers were on our game and fixing our focus, we wouldn't be looking back at 2020 as a dumpster fire. We'd be looking back on it as the refiner's fire. What a moment we had. What an opportunity we have to reset. God is doing great things. If we would join him in his story and not wallow in our fears of the, uh, the future and our depression over the past, and instead we just get up and win the day in God's story for what he has for us. How do I fix my focus? Let me give you three points. Keep a gratitude journal. I want you to walk away with this good nugget today. How can you get in this day? Well, keep a gratitude journal. Start writing down what you're thankful for in this day. I had a bad week this week. My back went out again. I'm here by the grace of God, caffeine and drugs right now. (laughs) My back hurts. And and, 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 oh, when that happens, you you can just see the negative in everything. You know, I, I, I usually pray before meals. Uh, This week, my wife jumped in on me and took over a prayer, and she just started thanking God. She started thanking God for the two deer that were in our backyard eating our apples. and She started thanking God for the house we live in. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's not where I was going to go. I simply wanted to rub it up, dub, thanks God for the grub, and eat. (laughs) And I listened to my wife thank God in the moment, in the day, (laughs) in what was actually happening. Friends, I I challenge you today. Start keeping a gratitude journal each day of the blessings we have in God. We're so good at the complaints we have for Him. Sometimes the complaints we have about Him. But we need to thank God each day. What else do we need to do? A change of pace and a change of place equals a change of perspective. Some of y'all are in such a rut. Coming out of uh, the year that we had, what a great opportunity to change the pace, to change the place. Some of you need a new uh, uh, a visual. You got to get out of from where you're at. Go down to the lake. Somebody needs to head to Big Fish Lake today and sit on the shore and put your sand, your, your toeses in the sands and just breathe. <laughs> change of pace, change of place, change perspective. We need to read old books. Somebody once said, if you want new ideas, read old books. <laughs> I challenge you, start living each day with gratitude. Get a new perspective on life by changing your pace and your place. You know what the blessing is of this hurt back of mine? I'm always going 100 miles an hour. Yeah, sometimes 150. I'm just running full bore, uh, gasoline and coffee. I just go, go, go. And, and to be honest with you, most of the time, everybody in the world is in my way. Don't, don't judge me, Joe, because you're a fast driver too. We, <laughs> everywhere we go, 
Every, he, where he does it on water, he goes too fast. I walk fast. Everybody in my family says, slow down. My pace is always fast. You know what a bad back does for you? It slows you down. I hate to admit this, but uh, I was at Bed Bath & Beyond yesterday. I know, don't even go there. <laughs> my back hurt so bad I had to go get a heated pad. So I, I bought a heated pad and I was on my way out. And you know that long corridor? I don't know who built that. That was a dumb idea. Long hallway to get out of the mall there. And, and I finished right after a, a lady finished. She was about my age. She was with her mom. They finished and walked out in front of me down the long corridor. And as they were walking out, I'm walking out behind them. And the, the lady my age probably realized her mom was too slow. And so she said, Mom, let's get out of the way for this gentleman. And I said, no, no, no need. My back's hurt. I can barely move. And Mama said, what's wrong with your back? And so we walked together. Me and her limping out the, the mall together. <laughs> Honestly, most days I would have ran her over. I would have, get out the way, lady. Here I come. I got a place to be, things to do. Yesterday, I, I had to take a different pace. And so I, I talked with a lady, and we both shared our aches and pains. You know, we got outside the mall. We didn't split to go to our cars. We stood on the sidewalk, and we kept talking. You know how long it's been since I've talked to a stranger? We got to fix our focus. Know your name. Fixing our focus is biblical again. Philippians 4, verse 8. It says, Whatsoever things are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think on these things. It's called cognitive reappraisal. Tell yourself a different story. We need to think on the positive things and what God is doing in blessing our lives. We we should realize if we would flip our script and get out of our negative story, our stinking thinking, that God's doing some amazing things in our lives. Change my story. What Joseph did. Actually, all of us are born into someone else's story. You know, you were born into your mom and dad's story and your mom and dad were born into your grandparents' story. Everybody's born into somebody else's story. Emory University did a study and they they found out how to help children have well-being, mental well-being. And it wasn't getting them into the best school. It wasn't taking them on a pilgrimage to Disney. It wasn't making sure they saw every Pixar film. They really found out that the key to a child's mental wellness was knowing their family history. Knowing who they are, where they came from. And I got news for you. As a child of God, Scripture becomes your script. The Bible becomes your backstory. Friends, you and I have been grafted into a new story. The Bible says, if anyone is a Christ, they're a new creation. Behold, the, the old is gone, the new is here. The moment you accepted Christ, you get a brand new story. And God's telling the story of you. If you want to know your family of origin, you ought to know the good God of the Bible. I'm a kingdom person living in a God's kingdom. That's my story. You're a kingdom person. You're living in God's kingdom. He's writing a beautiful story today. He's got a story to write with you. Don't miss it by living in the past or being worried about the future. You see, if God did it before, he can do it again. Why did I tell you the story of Joseph today? Because it's our family history. Messed up families, messed up lives, God's redemption. Joseph saved his family. He actually saved the whole nation. And God put him in that spot. God was doing something in that story. And Joseph flipped his script by saying, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for the good so i want to end today by telling you my story from last sunday last sunday i bragged before we left my wife tells me it's all my fault because i bragged that i was heading to the beach driving the bus with our teenagers to holland so that we could do a beach night well i got what i deserve for bragging i never got to the beach 
We took our teens to Holland and everything seemed fine. Our bus worked great all the way there. We dropped our kids off of the beach and I told my wife, we left here in a hurry. I barely got to slam a Jimmy John sandwich and I hadn't had coffee since before I preached. And we got all the way to Holland and I told my wife, I'm hungry and I need coffee. But let's pretend like we're getting gas in the bus. So I told Ben, Ben, I'm going to go fill the bus up with gas. And so we dropped the kids off at the beach and we left. A block away from where we were, I started smelling something hot, like a burnt rubber uh, Band-Aid. Julie said, I think it's just the factory. We got to Sam's Club and pulled in there to get gas. And I got out and I could smell it. Something's burning. It's on fire. Sure enough, I looked and the passenger front tire, smoke's pouring out of it. So Julie and I spent the whole day in Walmart parking lot. That's us. Julie actually took a nap inside the bus. She had her beach towel, so she just crashed. The culprit was a bad break. I don't know if you can see that old rusty old thing, but we had a, uh, the calipers froze up, and, and uh, it's Sunday, 3.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> we're in Walmart parking lot, and we're not going anywhere. I go inside, and... There's some mechanics working in the mechanic department, and I, I went to him. Julie was with me. She'll tell you. She was upset by this. Went to the mechanic, and I said, hey, sir, do you, do you know of any mechanics who could work on big buses? Uh, I got 30 teens at the beach today, and our buses broke down. I need somebody to come work on this bus. And he looked at me and just started to laugh. He said, are you kidding me? It's Sunday. Everybody's closed. And I said, I know, but I, I got to. And he laughed. And then he said, here, here, I'll tell you what to do. I'm like, oh, good. He said, go rent a hotel, spend the night, wake up in the morning, get your bus fixed. I said, sir, I got 30 teens. We're not buying 30 hotel rooms. I, mean, I, need, I need help today. He said, you're not getting out of here today. Oh, man. We went to the parking lot, and Julie started huffing and puffing about that. He laughed at us. Well, something had to give. On the way there, on a 196, we pass a Harley Davidson store, and I always point it out because I speak at a church every winter. I speak for a decade. I've been speaking to these teenagers for their youth pastor, a good friend of mine, and the church is in the same parking lot. I said, I, I want to be the pastor of that church someday. They got a Harley Davidson shop in the parking lot, yeah. And I pointed out every time I go by, hey, Julie, there's the church. That's Jamestown. That's Jamestown. And we drove on by. Well, after getting laughed at inside of Walmart, that there was no way that we're going to get help on a Sunday, and there's no way we're going to get parts for a big bus like that on a Sunday, I remember Jamestown, and I called my youth pastor friend, Ted. Bad reception, can barely talk. I'm talking, he said, I can't hear you. I'm talking, and I'm saying that the buses broke down, kids, in the, and he says, I can't understand what you're saying, but it sounds like you need help. It sounds like you need a mechanic. Nathan will call you. And Nathan called me. Nathan's mechanic that goes to Jamestown. He said, where are you? I said, I'm in, I'm in Holland's Walmart parking lot. You can't miss me. He said, I'll be there in a half hour. Nathan showed up. He's the one that took the wheel off, by the way. I couldn't even get those lug nuts off. I went inside and bought a wrench, but it, it wasn't going to do it. So <laughs> Nathan showed up. Turns out that Nathan's dad started uh, Forest Hills Auto Shop uh, 40 years ago. Nathan had that tire off and looking at that wheel, he said, are you sure it's this wheel? I said, I'm telling you, smoke was coming out of there. He goes, this one doesn't look too bad. It's rusty. It's awful, it's awful stiff, but I'm going to take the other wheel off. He took the other wheel off. It was totally froze, totally froze. Now I got two brakes need to be changed. It's five o'clock now. It's after five o'clock on Sunday. Nathan looks at me. He says, you're not going anywhere without these parts. And we're going to have a hard time finding parts for an F550, uh, 10, uh, whatever, big thing. <laughs> so while he's telling me that, I just picked up the phone and I'm like, auto parts. And the first thing came up was an auto zone. It was one mile away. And I called the auto zone. I'm thinking it's after five. They got to be closed. Joe answers the phone. I said, Joe, how long are you open? He said, we're open to nine. I'm like, that's good. I need some parts. He goes, what do you need? I said, here's the mechanic. Nathan said, Joe, I, got, I don't know. You're never going to have these parts. We got an F550, and we need both of the whole brakes, the whole thing, pads. I need everything for these. They're big. And I hear Nathan say, you're kidding me. You got both sides and all the pads. I said, tell Joe we're going to be there in a minute. 
we drove over to AutoZone, and Joe had these huge, by, these are huge brakes, by the way. They're big metal parts, and he's got two boxes on his counter. As soon as we walked in, he starts cussing and swearing. He said, you better buy these things, because I'm not putting them back on the shelf. They're too heavy. And Nathan's telling me they're not going to be the right parts. Nobody's going to have F-550 parts uh, on a Sunday, and there's no way. He opens up, and he goes, these are the parts. I said, Joe, don't worry about it. We're going to take them. He kept cussing and swearing, and, and Nathan finally said, they're going on a church bus. <laughs> and Joe said, oh. <laughs> we bought the parts, hustled back to the bus. I called Ben. Ben, what time are you hoping to leave today? He said, well, if we're going to get home on time, we need to leave at 7 o'clock. It's 6 o'clock now. I look at Nathan, and I said, Nathan, is there any way we're going to, what, what should I tell? Should we start calling parents and tell them we're going to be an hour late? He goes, no, you'll be back by 7 o'clock. Nathan puts both sides on, bleeds these brakes, tests them out, sends me back to the beach with my wife. We pull in the beach at 7.01. And I really wanted to go back in Walmart and find the mechanic. Because like Joseph, (laughs) I would have liked to say something to him. I would like him to know normal people can't get things fixed on Sunday after five, but I'm a kingdom person living in the kingdom of God. And God flipped the script. He can flip the script. Why? He's done it before. He can do it again. And we ought to be thankful. You ought to start a gratitude journal. Isn't that a pretty break? shiny part. That's Nathan. He's a hero. Yeah. Amen. (laughs) Halfway through the job, my wife, by the way, we sat there in those little camping chairs. Uh, We watched Nathan change the first side, and then we went to the other side. We took our chairs over, and and, and the whole time, my wife talked to him. The whole time, asking him questions. I'm like, let the man work. And Nathan just talked. He made this seem easy, doing this work come to find out halfway through the job, Nathan said, yeah, I had to leave my son's birthday party today. And oh, my wife about died. She said, Nathan, you leave. Go home. I said, no, no, put the wheel back on. Put the wheel back on. (laughs) And he said, no, no, you don't understand. My wife, Mandy, is a youth leader, and she's been listening to PD come and speak for 10 years. And when she found out that PD was in trouble, she said, you need to go save PD. You go rescue PD. You want to know the rest of the story? You guys remember when I got COVID? You remember me telling you how I got it? A group gave it to me that I went to speak for. (laughs) Jamestown gave me COVID. (laughs) You want to talk about flipping a script and knowing God's story and making him laugh? God's going, this is hilarious. (laughs) How's God going to put me in the same town to get rescued by the same church that gave me COVID, rescue us and get the kids back here without the parents even knowing we had a problem. How can God do all that? It's his story. And he invites us in it. And you know what? We got home that night. My wife and I ate some food. We went to bed with smiles on our faces. You know what? We'd won the day. We won the day. We went really long. So let me pray, and let's lead into communion. Father, I thank you for your word, the story of Joseph, which leads us as kingdom people to say, I need to flip my script and change my story. We're living on the wrong time zone. We're living off the wrong script. Let scripture be our script. Help it be script cure for our lives. God, I just pray you'd help us. Help us, God, to win each day. I pray it in Jesus' name. Would you take your cup? First Corinthians, we have directions about taking communion. What I love about communion, really, it's the story of Jesus flipping our script, isn't it? Don't we come to the table today as broken people? Don't we come as helpless and hopeless and in need of saving? And, and you know what? That's what Jesus did. He took the sinner that had no hope and he flipped the script and he died for us.
That's the story of the table, the Lord's table. His body was broken for you and for me. His blood was shed for you and for me to flip our script, to change our story. The Bible says don't take this lightly. As you come to the table, we celebrate what Jesus has done. Reflect. I'm going to give you a moment to just pray. And if there's sin in your life, if there's things that are wrong, just give them to God. Say, God, you need to flip my script. Change my story. I, forgive, I ask you to forgive me. And get me on the right path. Help me to win today. And help me get up and do it again tomorrow. In righteousness. Take some time and pray. Scripture, Jesus says, this is my body, which is for you. you partake of the bread. The Bible says that after supper, he took the cup. Jesus, we thank you for the shed blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. There's no forgiveness of sin. God, there's no new story without Jesus' blood. But with his blood, our sins are washed away white as snow. We're given a new name, a new destiny, a new family history. So thank you for the blood of Jesus. And take the cup. Partake. I ask the team to come up and join me. After thanking the Lord for what He's done for us on the cross, we like to sing a song called The Blessing. Yeah, why don't you stand with us? You can sing with us this and I'll give you the last chorus as our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you.
and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen and amen. You're dismissed. Have a great day. Win it. We're going to play. Got some left.